Hi, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Today we're going to be talking about synthesis and really about creating notes. So this is going to be a very brief introductory talk to the whole topic of musical notes. We plan to do some music theory later, but we need to start here before we can really talk about synthesis. So I hope this is useful. I hope you're all doing well. Let's jump right into it. So synthesis, what is audio synthesis? It's where you make a sound. It's, you know, anal not analysis. It's not an effect typically applied to a sound, but you're actually making music from scratch. To me, it's the most interesting and fun part of digital audio, but it builds on everything we've done up to now pretty much. There's a lot of different kinds of ways to make a sound. You can use wavetables and use some sound you found in nature and turn it into your own thing. You can use additive subtractive synthesis to literally create a sound from scratch. Another from scratch method we'll talk about is frequency modulation. There's a whole bunch of really fancy synthesis approaches that are sort of outside the scope of this course, like that I'll mention briefly and then pass by things like granular synthesis I might show you a little demo of. So yeah, there's really been a lot of thought and interest. Really, the analog age and then the digital age have both corresponded to sort of renaissances, successive renaissances in the creation of musical instruments. We had a big renaissance in the renaissance. We had a big renaissance in the 1800s when technology, mechanical technology, allowed us to build new instruments like the saxophone that nobody had ever seen before. And then when we could build instruments out of circuits, we got to play the whole game again with analog synthesis. And now we're playing it again with digital synthesis and the ability to make sounds that would be hard and challenging to make even with analog electronics sometimes, and that are cool sounds that the world hasn't really had in instrument form before. But before we can talk about synthesis, we have to talk about musical notes just a little bit, because typically when you're synthesizing, you're at least paying attention to the foundations of music and often the foundations of Western music. And so you have to think about what a note is, and we really haven't talked about that too much. A note is just a sound with a given frequency, and that frequency is sort of the value of the note. So it's not a very complicated concept, but the thing to keep in mind is that in Western music, we use a 12-tone scale. So if you look at a piano keyboard, there's 12 notes, white keys and black keys, between one octave and the next, and I'll talk about octaves in a bit. And so because of that, we really want to divide up the frequencies. We, a note is typically at one of a few fixed frequencies. Uh, the MIDI key, you know, standard, which we talked about last time, has note numbers in or no, that we'll talk about next, has note numbers in it. It has 128 note numbers. That's the most it will support. And those correspond to specific frequencies of specific notes because the MIDI standard was originally designed really to work with keyboards as its instrument. And there aren't really keyboards with more than 128 notes of range. The typical piano keyboard has 88 notes on it. Each one is supposed to be at a particular frequency. And that's the whole story of note values. So the thing to keep in mind that makes it a little confusing is we've said before frequency the ear hears frequencies logarithmically or exponentially if you prefer uh increasing by a constant amount of frequency a constant amount of cycles per second it doesn't sound like you're going up very fast after a while because the notes sound really really close together and so we're going to have to take that into account when we're defining our scale. An octave is just a frequency that's twice some other frequency. So it, our one kilohertz tone that we've been playing, an octave up from that is a two kilohertz tone. An octave up from that is a four kilohertz tone, right? This, this is 
you know, powers of two. You're all computer scientists here, I think, mostly. So these powers of two should be pretty comfortable objects for you. But that's what we got is we got powers of two to deal with. And that's kind of the basis of first basis of the scale is that we pick some arbitrary starting point and then we think about notes in terms of octaves and further though we're going to subdivide the octave into 12 parts why 12 well because reasons and when we talk about music theory we'll talk more about the reasons and what's going on here but just accept that for now pretty much everything you hear on the radio has notes that are based on the idea that first we divide the frequency into octaves and then we divide each octave into 12 equal parts. And when I say 12 equal parts, again, the ear hears sound logarithmically. So it isn't that we divide the octave, you know, if the range from 1000 to 2000 kilohertz, we don't just divide by 12 so that we get, um, you know, plus 1 12 plus 2 twelfths and so on in frequency because that wouldn't sound right. Instead, we need to divide sort of taking the exponentiation into account. And so the formula we end up with is, you know, we take the base frequency and we multiply it by two to the I over 12th power. So if I have some base frequency, then, you know, two to the zero is one. So sure enough, the zeroth note is blah. The note, the twelfth note here is going to be well, the thirteenth really because we're counting from zero like computer scientists. But the note an octave up is twelve steps up from that. That's going to be you know twelve over twelve, so it'll be f times two. It'll be two f. If we go the other way, if we want to go two octaves down, well minus twenty four over twelve. But you know the point is that any integer here works in this equation, and so that gives us our division of the octave into twelve equal parts and we have to make sure we get that exponential in the term or it's not going to make sense so there's a bunch of music theory here why 12 well because it's a good close approximation to some older western music ideas that allows you to move the bass frequency around without changing the relationship so we have this thing that in the in the in the sort of tonal space where we're thinking about things exponentially, I can slide up or down and it still is gonna have the same relationship. It's still gonna sound the same. Relative notes are still gonna sound the same to your ears. Um, for Western scales, we just choose that bass frequency to be 440 Hertz. That happens to be the frequency that got defined for reasons that you can find videos about on YouTube and everything else to be a long time ago, to be the sort of base frequency. That 440 Hertz A is the base musical note that we key everything else off of. And there's a good numbering scheme for these notes is the sort of MIDI, which we'll talk about next time, piano keys. You know, key numbers actually are a way to think about notes that's very convenient for computer terms. So key 69 is a 440 hertz A in MIDI. So if you get a request to play key number 69 on your synthesizer, you will spit out 440 hertz. That's the, we call that the A in octave four because piano keyboard. And so that's an A4. Um, that's the absolute reference note of Western music. And going up from there, we just give the names, the notes letter names, but there's this sharp or flat modifier, which is confusing because the same note has two different names sometimes. So that 440A is the A in octave four, then you get the B flat or A sharp in octave four, and that's at 466.16 hertz. And at 493.88, and again, this is, you know, two to the times two to the zero over 12, times two to the one over 12, times two to the two over 12, and so forth. There's nothing magic here. 
And so I take this key number, subtract it from 69, multiply by two to that many twelfths, and I'm good to go. And the notes go A, B flat or A sharp, B, C, D flat or C sharp, D, E flat or D sharp, E, F, F sharp or G flat, G, a flat or G sharp, and finally back to the octave A. So these notes that are an octave apart have the same name. They're just in. They just have a different octave. So if I wanted to get to the um, F in octave five, I would multiply this by two because that's how octaves work, and I would get some number that's about fourteen hundred hertz, a little less than fourteen hundred hertz, and that would be the F in octave five as opposed to the F in octave four. So as we go up the scale or down the scale, we have this exact same relationship all the way up. And, down. and like I say, there's a lot of why about this. I really don't want to talk about the why too much right now because it's not important. It's just an important thing to know as we get into synthesis is that we're going to be asked, our synthesizer is going to be asked to play notes when it's asked to play notes, we need to know what frequencies to spit out. And the answer is this. The other thing a note has besides a frequency is a duration. They, it's how, you know, they, they start and then eventually stop. It would be rare to have a note that goes for an entire song that's called a drone. And if you had a drone, you'd get to the end of the song and the drone would stop. So we think about notes as having a frequency and a duration. And we think about the duration typically in terms of an on time, when does the note start, and an off time, when does the note stop. And typically it stops on an even multiple or even submultiple of some fundamental frequency. In your pop songs that you hear, the there's a there's a sort of fundamental frequency, which is often around 60 or 120 beats per minute. And so if you divide the minute up into that length and you look at where the notes start and stop, they typically start and stop either right on those or on half of those or on a third of those or something like that. So there's this sort of musical clock and that's gonna be important. But again, for synthesis, the main thing we need to know is that we won't just get a request to play a note, we'll be get a request to start a note, and then later we'll get a request to stop a note. And those two requests define the note length. The, so the start times are usually four to 30 milliseconds apart. The durations are usually four milliseconds and up. A four millisecond note is a very, very fast note. A 30 millisecond note would be more. Normal. You can have very long notes. It's certainly not uncommon, even in pop music, to have notes that last for a substantial fraction of a second. It just depends on what the bass is doing. Note, note. Pay attention to the fact that different notes can overlap. That's what's called polyphony, right? So you typically don't hear a song that's just one instrument playing one part, and so you only hear one note at a time. That would be a really unusual kind of song to hear. Typically there's either multiple instruments or single instruments like the guitar or piano that can play more than one note at a time. And so you've got to pay attention to that. Early, synthesi early analog synthesizers tended to be monophonic. They could only play one note at a time. So they were more like a clarinet than they were like a guitar or a piano. And yet they had piano keyboards. The famous Moog, um, Mini Moog, which is probably the most famous synthesizer of all time, was a monophonic synthesizer. That's because with analog electronics, if you want to have multiple notes, you have to have multiple copies of all the electronics. There's no other reasonable way to do it. And if you want to have something like a piano that can potentially play 88 notes at all at the same time, then you need 88 copies of the circuitry. And unless the circuit's pretty simple, then you're not going to have very much fun with that. Of course, with computers, I can sort of build all the notes at once, and computers are very fast, and so polyphony gets easier. So as soon as we moved to digital and then to computers, it became very rare to build 
monophonic synthesizers. If you did, you were typically emulating some old analog synthesizer. I had a, uh, I got from my friend Keith many, many years ago and played until it broke a Yamaha instrument called the CP30, whose, that was an 88 key synthesizer. It was all in one package that had really great electric piano sounds that were really novel. It actually had two analog oscillators per key. So there were 160 little, 172 little, uh, 176 little oscillator boards sitting in a rack inside that instrument. It was heavy as heck and it was fiddly, but it could sound cool. Uh, now you wouldn't build something like that. Day you would build some piece of software stuff all software so that's notes that's what you need to know about those and the plan here the sort of fundamental synthesis plan is to receive requests for notes and turn those into interesting musical sounds and Next lecture, we'll talk about something called MIDI, the Musical Instrument Digital Interface, which is the standard way in synthesis really to get requests for notes from an instrument and the, from a controller. And then after that, we'll talk about, okay, I've got some notes I'm supposed to be playing. What do I do now? I hope this was useful. I know it was a brief talk, but I felt like we needed to lay that foundation before we synthesis. And I will talk to you soon when we talk about MIDI. Again, hope you're doing well. Thanks for listening.